Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. We all have a story. It's good to be back here and it's good to see you if you are here watching and listening. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it and I hope you all are doing well and that you have been having a wonderful summer so far. So today's video is going to be about my trip to uh, Tijuana, Mexico to see, to go to the Hoxie Clinic. It's a, it's a cancer clinic and they treat, I think they probably treat things other than cancer, but mostly what they treat is cancer. And people from all over the world go down there to get treated by them. The Hoxie Clinic is not the only clinic in Mexico, or even Tijuana, that treats cancer, but it's the one that I chose because of their affordability. So let's just start with, you know, how did I find out about the Hoxie Clinic? So it, it's funny how things just all kind of come, you know, just fall into place. I, I have, I, I do pet sitting on the side. Sorry, once again, my, my co-host, Mr. Rocky, he's always with me, but I do pet sitting on the side and I had a pet sitting client, my the first pet sitting client, first new pet sitting client that I've had in a really, really long time. She is a kind of a holistic, I don't know what her title is, maybe, I'm sure she's got a title and I don't know what it is, but she does a lot of holistic healing type things. She's cer certified and, and has credentials and whatever. So, you know, I went to go meet with her about the job that I need to do with pet sitting. And she told me about what she does. I told her about, you know, my cancer. And I don't know why, I guess it came up in conversation. And she gave me some videos to watch. And one was The Truth About Cancer, a global something or other. And they, so I started watching the videos and they go, it's, it's like eight videos or nine. So it's very extensive. I actually haven't finished it, but I did get to the parts to where they start showing different people that have been cured from cancer in different ways, ways outside of chemotherapy and ways outside of radiation and all that. And one of the many things that they talked about was the Hoxie clinic down in New Mexico, in Mexico. So pretty much as soon as I'd heard about the clinic, I looked them up and found out that their that their regimen you know is relative is, is affordable at least compared you know i i had a natural no it's not natural but it was an integrative health people here in town give me some clinic ideas referrals and i looked them up and like one place in arizona is you go down there to arizona you stay for an entire month and they do all these different treatments on you intravenous vitamin c probably hypobaric probably the laetril, which is the apricot seeds, the vitamin B17. And you do whatever it is, and it's $30,000 for the month. Like, who can afford that? Like a celebrity, a politician, but certainly not me. And not only on top of that, you got to stay for a month. Now, what do you do with your life back at home, your, your animals and everything else? So I was like, well, I ain't, ain't going to work. I, I can't do that. So the Hoxie Clinic, when I looked them up, now, there are additional treatments that I could have opted for, like intravenous vitamin C, like hyperbaric, and all, all these things that I've mentioned. But I chose not to do that because a lot of those things I can actually get here in Colorado if I really wanted to. But what I really liked is they have a tonic, and there's a story behind their tonic. I talked about it on a previous video, but they have a tonic that they have been perfecting for decades and decades. It started off in like the 1800s and some farmer in the 1800s realized that when his horses had some had tumors, they would start eating this grass that they've never eaten before at the edge of his field and, and their tumors would be healed. And that's kind of like how everything got started. And eventually he, he tried that with humans and it was working with humans too. Anyway, I have another video where I talk about that and maybe I'll figure out the whole linking process. I'm not an expert at this whole video thing yet, but um, then maybe put it in one of these places here. But so they've got this tonic, which by the way, I am late to take. And they have this tonic, which they send home with you. And they also draw your blood, take your blood. They ask for your medical records. And you have to send those to them either ahead of time or bring them with you. And they also have recommend supplements and a diet plan. So, you know, this is how it goes. So I was like, okay. And then the price was reasonable. It was anywhere between like $1,800 and $3,000. 
to go down there, get all of that stuff, come home with it. Of course, you got to pay for your hotel and flight and whatever. I made an appointment for August 5th, I believe it was. And then I booked my flight, went, you know, and booked my hotel. They, they recommend a couple of hotels, but I didn't like any of the options. It seemed like they kind of overcharged you if you are a biomedical center. They, okay, so the place has two different names. There's Hoxie Clinic, which it originally was. And then when the nurse of Hoxie died, she's the one that opened up the clinic down in Mexico. I think they changed the name to Biomedical Center. But whatever, everybody knows it as the Hoxie Clinic. So they recommend a couple of hotels, which I didn't like either option. And they recommend, you, it's a really good idea. It's a very bad idea to drive from San Diego to Mexico yourself. Not because it's a dangerous thing, but because it's, it's just tricky. It's tricky. And so they recommend people who will drive you. So I called the driver and tried to set that up. And he's the one that said, you know, you know, you could stay at other places as long as it's within 30 minutes of Tijuana, I'll come pick you up. So I booked, well, it wasn't me, but I, I ended up at a hotel that was not any of the two that they recommended. And it was great. You know, I stayed on what was called, what was the name of that? Something Island. Dang it, I always forget the name of that island. But anyway, it's one of the islands. It's right across the waterway from the naval base. So that's where I stayed. So, pardon my cat. who's <laughs> jumping around. So, anyway, so I scheduled the driver and I scheduled my appointment and then I just waited to go. You know, I stayed in San Diego. You could stay in Mexico if you want to. They do have accommodations at the clinic for you to stay in. Or you can stay in San Diego. Well, I wanted to stay in San Diego because I wanted to see San Diego and I didn't really care to venture around Tijuana. So the day comes for me to go. Let me just tell you what happened. I I, had, I booked a flight out of Colorado Springs because I do not fly Denver any more than I have to, at least not in my original destination. But I did have to book, a, you know, if I book, if I flew out of Colorado Springs, I had to go to Denver and then San Diego. So I booked my flight for a Sunday evening because that's when my daughter comes back from her dad's house and I took her to um, the people that I designated to, to watch her and then I got on a plane. And then I wanted to come back before Wednesday evenings. That's when she goes back to her dad's house for a couple of hours or a Wednesday afternoon actually. So I go to the airport and you know, I've got an hour and a half layover in Denver thinking no big deal. Go to the Colorado Springs airport, get on a plane, get to Denver. I get to wait an hour and a half. Well, as I get to the Colorado Springs airport, and even before I get there, I find that my flight's been delayed. And then it was delayed again. And then it was delayed again. And now I'm starting to sweat bullets because my hour and a half layover is turning into like a 10 minute layover. And it, you know, I had the option of rebooking, which would be stupid because I had to be in Mexico at nine o'clock the following morning or hoping and praying that Somehow I make it to Denver so I don't miss my flight to San, uh, San Diego. Well, I made my flight, praise the Lord. But it was very tight and they did hold the plane for me, but I didn't find out until I ran a mile. Well, I didn't run because I don't do a lot of running these days, but I did walk very briskly to about a mile to get to my connecting flight. And it wasn't until I got to my connecting flight that they said, oh, don't worry, we're holding the plane for you. Oh, well. That information would have been important maybe 10, mon 10 minutes ago before I killed myself trying to get here in time. Nonetheless, I made it. And so my brother picked me up from the airport, went back to the hotel. Next morning, we get up and wait for, you know, get ready and then wait for our driver who picks us up, me and him, because he went with me, picks us up at the hotel and drives us into Tijuana. Well, my, my poor, I should have told, I should tell everybody at every time that if anything, if you're doing anything that has to do with me and picking me up and taking me somewhere, something's going to happen. I mean, that's just my, my aura or whatever, you know, something's always going to happen. My poor driver before he came to pick us up was he had to pick somebody else up because you're not the only one in the vehicle. And he, he hit his head on the door of the minivan that he uses to drive people and put a big old gash in his head before he comes to get it. So he was late picking us up. I'm kind of a little low key freaking out because we're getting later and later. My appointment's at nine. Well, the good thing is these people at Hoxie, they're, they're really pretty cool. 
It's not like here in the United States where you need, if you're more than 10 minutes late, you have to reschedule your appointment. No. We called them ahead of time. They said, don't worry, get here when you get here and we'll take care of you. Praise the Lord. So, because he still had to pick someone else up after he picked us up. So he picked someone up before us, then us, and then he had to pick someone else up. So we get in, you know, we drive into Tijuana and get to the uh, clinic. And these drivers, this particular driver especially, I don't know if they all do, but they go there in the morning and then they sit all day and wait for you because it's not worth it to try to get back over the border and then come. So they stay at the clinic all day. You know, they, there's a little cafe there and they hang out in the cafe. They And they do this. I might be jumping ahead of myself here, but they, they do what they do because they believe in the clinic. They really love the clinic and they believe in it. And so they are drivers and that's their sole mode of income. So if you are ever in this situation where you have to go to the Hoxie Clinic, please tip your driver well, because he's doing a really a, an amazing thing. And he was so kind. And so just through the whole process, he was just so kind and so accommodating. And he reminded me a week before, hey, don't forget about your appointment. And then he reminded me like the day before and just really on top of things. So we get to Tijuana and, you know, the clinic has these big, I guess, are they wooden gates or they might have been metal gates, big metal gates. So we have to open the gates and go in. And you walk, you go in there and it's kind of a modest place, but yet it's also kind of striking. They've got this big, huge aviary with all these birds right there in the courtyard area when you first go in. And I don't know why that is. I guess somebody in the clinic decided they like they like birds. And so that's what they, they have this big aviary. And so you go in these big, huge wooden doors. You know, Mexico, that's, that's kind of like their architecture. They got these big, heavy wooden doors. And you go in and you, you sign in. And your appointment is supposed to be at nine, but you know, what happens is you, you go, you sign in, you go sit down in their, in their little waiting room, which is right off this big, beautiful balcony. Um, it's more like a terrace. I would call it a terrace more than I would a balcony. And it's beautiful. You know, you sit there, it's, they've got the nice, I don't know if it was marble floors, but it was that kind of stone type material. And the terrace has these big balusters, is that I think so they're called. Just it's in your on a hill, you're overlooking the city. It's beautiful. And so you go and you wait. And the first thing that they do is they take you back and decide if they need to, you know, to draw blood on you. Not everybody needs that because maybe they've just had their blood drawn and they don't need it. But I, I think they generally draw blood on everybody because they want to have their own lab results and their own tests that they run. So eventually you go back, you get your blood drawn, which getting your blood drawn. I don't know if it's a Mexico thing or if it's just a Hoxie clinic thing, but it's a little bit different. You know, here they've got, you know, well, it's hard to explain, but you know, the vials go in this like little thing. So here's the vial. Here's the thing that it goes in. And this thing right here is attached to, in America, it's attached to a tube that's attached to a needle that goes in your arm. And you can see the blood go down the tube and into the little vials. And then they can pull the little vial out, put the next one in. Well, in Mexico, this little thing right here doesn't have a tube. It has a needle. <laughs> so <clears throat> it just, it goes, the needle, this little thing goes straight into your arm. And the needle's a good, size, good amount bigger than they are here in the United States. And I had a bruise for like a week. But I will say she got my vein on the first try which is unusual. Most people don't. I'm always a little nervous about them going in through my arm. In America, I asked them to use a butterfly needle and go in through my hand, which they can always hit, except for one awful person in Hawaii who was a terrible phlebotomist. But most people can hit a vein on my arm right away. I mean, my hand. Well, they didn't do that in Mexico. They didn't have butterfly needles. And if she would have had to go in through my hand, she would have used that big, huge needle that she used on my arm. So I'm glad that she got my vein. So anyway, so I got my blood drawn. Once you get your blood drawn, you wait a little bit longer. And now you're supposed to be fasting the night before. So you're kind of, you get there, you're kind of hungry. But you have to wait till you see the doctor the first time before you can go eat. And they have a cafe there and that you can go eat at. And all the food in the cafe is compliant with their diet that they put you on. And so you have to wait to go see the doctor. And you wait another, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes or so because they've got different, you know, clients that they're having to see. 
and you go and see the doctor. And then, you know, she sits you down and she kind of, one of the first things she says is, I, I need to tell you that we cannot make any guarantees that we will be able to cure you. You understand that, correct? Yes, I understand that. Which is funny because in the United States, they'd make us sign something. But maybe she did. She might have made me sign something. I'm not sure. But, and then she, what did she do in that first little visit? You know? I don't really remember. I think she kind of went over the program. She, oh, and she, okay, so she she asked me questions about myself, about my diagnosis, what led me to my diagnosis. And, and, and she, it was just basic information gathering from me and kind of getting to know me as a, as a client. And and then you have, so you have your first initial appointment and you, you're in there for maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. And then she's like, Okay, you're done for now. You know, we, you've had your blood drawn. We're going to wait for your test results to come in. And then I'll see you back here in a little while, you know, a couple hours maybe at the most. And so then you can go eat. So you go to the, the clinic, I mean, the uh, cafe, and it's, it's like a lunch counter, like the old 60s lunch counters. So you've got this big, long counter, and you go sit, up, sit down off the counter. On the other side of the counter is the kitchen. And you've got the man who comes over, and he gets your order. And the woman is cooking. I think it might be his mother. And maybe not. I don't know. I didn't ask. But I just assumed. And so you, it's funny because we, got the, we, we sat down to eat at about 1030. And on the menu, it said breakfast served from whatever time to 1030. And I, so we asked her, like, are can we, can we get lunch? And the lady's like, no, no, no lunch. Breakfast, breakfast only. And, you know, she didn't really appear to speak much English, but he did. He spoke really fluent English. He's like, no, I'm sorry. We're just doing breakfast right now. Okay. So, you know, I ordered, I think I ordered an omelet. My brother ordered, I really, I was so hungry. I was going to order an omelet and pancakes, but I was just, and, and each of them were their individual breakfasts, but I, I ended up just getting the omelet because I really thought I wanted to eat the omelet and the pancakes, but I, d I didn't end up needing that much food. So everything is, okay, so let's talk about, well, let's finish with the day. So so we had our, our breakfast and, you know, the, we, everything was good. And the, the man that waited on you was super friendly, very, very kind. The driver, it's cash only, and I didn't have any cash, except for the cash that I was going to use to pay my driver. Well, thankfully, my driver was in there eating breakfast, and he's like, go ahead and order. I'll pay for it, and we'll figure out how to get me money afterwards. I mean, that's how great these people are. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, wow, that was that's that's really awesome. Thank you so much. And he was, and I kept trying to, like, pay him immediately, you know, because I could go through Venmo or Zelle or whatever. He's like, no, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get it taken care of. I know where you're staying. And he, he, it wasn't until the end of the day that he finally took payment from me. So he paid for our, our breakfast and we finished up. And when we finished up breakfast, we went back into the little waiting room area and they were having a seminar on nutrition, on the Hoxi diet nutrition, which had started before we got there, but um, we didn't miss that much. But really the basics, okay, so the basics about the diet, there's four things that you absolutely cannot eat while you are taking the Hoxi tonic because allegedly these four things will deactivate the tonic. Which is kind of weird. I don't know how or why these things deactivate the tonic, but according to them, they do, and you cannot eat any of them. So the four things are pork. Can't eat any kind of pork product, product, which is fine by me because I'm not a real big fan of pork. I do eat bacon, but I can live without bacon. I can do turkey bacon, but it's kind of gross. So pork, no pork, no alcohol, which is fine because I don't drink alcohol. But, you know, we have to think of like you know, uh, medicines, and we have to think about extracts, like vanilla extract, or anything like that. So nothing that has alcohol, uses alcohol, anything like that. So no pork, no alcohol, no tomatoes, not any kind of tomatoes. You know, if, it, if there's a food that has a tomato paste, tomato flour, or, or powder, I guess, any kind of tomato, you can't eat it. Or vinegar. Nothing, 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 nothing with vinegar. So that means there are a lot of breads you can't eat because they're made with vinegar. There's pretty much any sauce or dressing is made with vinegar unless you make it yourself. So those are the four things that you absolutely cannot eat because you will deactivate the tonic. It will not work. Um, and then, of course, they go over all the other nutrition that they expect that they want you to follow. For some reason, not a, no aged cheeses. And I'm not clear as to why that is which kills me because I'm a very big cheese person. I mean, I can have fresh mozzarella, but then I got to watch out because it's made with vinegar. A lot of them, because I looked on the label today and it said vinegar on there. So fresh mozzarella, if you can find one made without vinegar, 
no table salt. They want you to use sea salt, which is hard because a lot of cheeses, whether they're fresh or not, are made with salt, not sea salt. Uh, there's some Mexican cheeses that are fresh. It's kind of hard. The cheese thing is a little hard for me because I, I love cheese. And so no table salt, but use sea salt and it has to be a very tiny amount. They only want you to have like a teaspoon and a half of salt a day or something like that. I don't use a lot of salt, so I don't feel like I've exceeded that, but I have to be careful with the foods that I eat that already have salt in it, even if it's sea salt. I have to somehow manage not to go over my recommended amount. So sea salt, no kind of white or bleached flour whatsoever. So I've been eating the Ezekiel 49 bread, Ezekiel 49 tortillas. I could probably do, but see, you have to be careful because also no sugar, no refined white sugar. So there's a lot of breads. I, even if it's a whole wheat bread, I can't eat it because it's made with sugar. So I stick with Ezekiel 4.9. They do the low sodium, which right now I haven't done low sodium one because I bought this stuff beforehand, but I will switch to the low sodium kind. So those are kind of the big things. No microwave use. I don't want you using a microwave because they say it kills the nutrients in the food. It like zaps them and kills the nutrients. So I'll probably still use a microwave if I need to warm up my coffee because I'm not trying to get nutrients out of coffee. I'm just trying to drink it. <laughs> so, but you know, there are good things about coffee that are good for your body. So maybe I shouldn't, but I probably will. I don't drink that much coffee these days anyway. So anyway, so I got in there, got went through the seminar and then it was time to see the doctor again. And she does a health check. She lays you down and just like you do at the doctors here, they make you take off your top half and they do all the examination of your head and your chest and your belly and your armpits. And But the difference here, and I don't know if it was just this doctor or if it's just a difference between the United States and Mexico, but literally everything that she's doing, she's telling me about. So I learned some things about myself that no doctor here in the United States ever told me about, and I won't tell you about it because it's none of your business, <laughs> but it's a... It's an informational item that I've never been told before about my biology, about my physiology. But, you know, as she's doing my lymph nodes, she's saying, nope, nothing feels swollen here. Everything looks good here. Lymph nodes look good here. Your liver, she's down here. She's like, your liver is enlarged, but you knew that already because of this, this, or that. And then she's going over here, and I don't see, you know, there's a lot of gas in your colon. She can feel the gas by doing it. She's, as she's doing, you know, she went down my legs. Your skin is a little dry, you know, do the blah, blah, blah for that. And that she's, you know, I mean, as she's doing it, she's narrating everything that she's doing, which is a little different. The doctors here just kind of do it and don't really say anything until the end. They, if they find anything to tell you, then they might. But this one, she's like... She even asked me when she did breast exam, is it okay if I examine your breasts? Do you, is that okay with you? Yeah, that's fine. And like I said, everything, everything she touched, she narrated. And I thought that was kind of cool. I kind of liked that. So, so we got done with that. And then she went over my blood test results, which was also so much better because she, she had the paper. She went over everything. These numbers here or these metrics here explain your kidney function. So as you can see, your kidney function, blah, 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 blah. These numbers here explain your liver function. So this number here is, shows that it's a little high, probably because of this. This number here shows it's a little low. These two numbers usually work counteract and counteraction with each other. I think I just made that word up. So if this one's low, this one's going to be a little high. So as you can see, it's working properly. And then she said, these numbers here are about, about your white blood cells. These are about your red blood cells. I mean, she explained everything thoroughly. And I don't know about you, but my doctors here in the United States, they give you a blood test. They don't explain crap to you. I mean, they don't explain anything. They're just like, you just look and see what numbers are elevated. And, and it's like, I don't know what all these numbers mean. So she finally explained that stuff to me. So then after that was done, I will say, so there is a number that I get monitored every month. It's called CEA, and it's a tumor marker type number. When I got mine done here in the United States, the last number was like 149. Normal's between 0 and 5, so I'm way outside of the normal range. But at the clinic, my number was only 92. So I don't know if it's a difference in labs. I don't know if United if U.S. labs inflate numbers to some degree 
to make things look worse than they are so that they can offer you more services. I don't know. And that's the conspiracy theorist in me kind of going. Or maybe my tumors had already started shrinking by that point. And it was a reflection of my tumor shrinking. That would be nice. Hopefully that's what it was. She also did an additional test that I've never had done here in the United States, which is, she says, a more specific tumor marker for people with your types of cancer. And normal for that number was something like 0 to 37. And mine was like 1900 and something. She says, but we're not going to worry about that today. That is our baseline for when you come back next time. And we'll see what happens between now and then with that number. So then she gave me my my plan and you know what she and what she wants me to do the tonic how much to take it she explained very thoroughly how to take the tonic what to do with it what you must remember to do keep it refrigerated 100% all the time once you open it she was very patient with me cuz i kept interrupting her <laughs> and at some point she was just like one step at a time and that's my that was my cue to shut up and she was very kind about it So she went over the tonic. She went over all the other supplements that I had to get. She went over the diet, you know, and explained to me where I needed, what I needed to do next. So some of the supplements I got from the Hoxie Clinic, and then some of them we had to go to a pharmacy in Tijuana to pick up, which that was interesting (laughs) because it's not like a CVS where you walk in and there's pharmaceuticals or, or any kind there. It was basically just kind of like back it looked like a like a I guess kind of like an old rundown strip mall and you walk into one of the you know one of the stores and really all there was was kind of at least what I noticed like an empty room and an old fashioned like drugstore counter and that was it (laughs) there was nothing in the in the drugstore display counter that I remember and then our bags of supplements that it wasn't just me but the other lady was with me had to get additional supplements were waiting there for us and and my brother he went he's like it looked it felt like a drug deal (laughs) it totally did but anyway so we had to we got a couple I got a couple supplements from the clinic a couple of supplements from that pharmacy another one she wanted me to buy off Amazon and then the tonic and once I was done with all of that I was done I just had to wait for the other lady to finish and so we got there right about on time about four o'clock in the evening or afternoon. And then the driver took us home, which was an adventure because getting across the border is ridiculous. Uh, Thankfully, you know, he had a medical waiver, so he got to go in the, I don't remember what he called it, but basically the fast lane, where if we didn't have a medical waiver, we might still be sitting there. (laughs) I mean, seriously, it takes, he said sometimes up to seven hours to get across that border. And that's because there are roughly 15 lanes of traffic backed up for miles, like miles, all 15 lanes. There may have been like 10 lanes operating that day, literally backed up for miles and they weren't moving. So it was a little crazy, but if you have the medical waiver, you can get in the fast lane and he knew of the fast lanes, which ones are the fastest because there's one fast lane that it might take you an hour to get through. There's another fast lane that might take you 15, 20 minutes. So my driver was knowledgeable, praised the Lord. He was kind, generous. And if not for him, I'd probably still be sitting in line waiting to get back in the United States. So this is why it's not advisable for you to try to get over there by yourself. Always have a driver. And so then he he took us home and I stayed an extra day to hang out in San Diego. My brother left the following evening. I left the Wednesday morning. And San Diego was nice, hung out in San Diego, had a good time, ate at a nice Indian restaurant the first night, and then the next night, what did we do? Oh, we ate at this Irish pub type place, went shopping down on Coronado Island. I think it's an island. Just had a good time. It's San Diego is beautiful. I really love it. The one of my favorite things that we did was we just went to this coffee shop and just hung out in front of the coffee shop. Like, I don't get to do that, like, hardly ever. Like, it just felt like being normal. I walked there. I walked about a mile there and a mile back, and I felt amazing. I think it's because I was at sea level. I think there's something to high altitude that's not necessarily the best for your body. I'm about 8,000 feet here, a little little lower than 8,000 feet. So I, I felt amazing. I felt healthy and normal. 
and I still pretty much do. You know, I've been doing a lot of things. I'm going to do another video that goes over my daily routine of everything that I do in a day. I mean, all the supplements I take, all the things that I drink um, to try to fight this cancer. You know, I don't just do the hoxy. But anyway, let's get down to the important part. I'll go over that in another video. How much did this cost me? So, of course, I booked, what, three nights at a hotel. Of course, my flight. And then the driver was $100 for me, $50 for my brother, for the extra passenger. And it was well deserved. He definitely deserved that money. And then and then he had to bring someone else after us. Like in that evening time, he had my driver had to go and pick up someone else after he dropped all of us off back at our hotel. So we got back to our hotel at like five. He had to go pick someone else up and take them to the clinic, but he was not going to have a medical waiver because they only give medical waivers certain times throughout the week and certain hours throughout the week. He was not going to have a medical waiver to get back over. So he had to wait in that crazy line to get to the United States that evening. He probably didn't get home till three or four o'clock in the morning. Poor guy. So he deserved every penny that I gave him. Where was I going with that? Oh, the cost. So all said and done for the medical examination, the blood test, the supplements, the tonic, and all the information... I paid, when it was all said and done, just for that piece of it, I paid, I think, $2,400. And that's a six-month supply. So they give you a six-month supply of everything. I have to go back in six months. And that's amazing. Six months, I saw a doctor. I had a blood test. I saw a doctor twice, actually. had a blood test. I had a medical examination. And I got six-month supply of everything that I need for $2,400. $2, so I thought that that was... Much better than the 30000 from the other place. One lady that, that we picked up on the way there, she was actually going to stay there all week. And she was going to do all of their other little treatments that they do. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. Was it breast cancer? I think it was like three years ago. She says that, the, that her cancer hasn't been cured, but she says... She also still feels good three years in. She feels fine. I don't think her cancer is advancing. So to me, that's a success because her cancer is being held at bay. And at some point, they say it could take up to five years of being on the, on the regimen before you see, you know, before you're cured. Which, you know, that, that's a typical for a, a natural type treatment. You know, it's going to take some time where, you know, we want, we want to go get chemo and be cured in six months or a year. But that's not how it works this way. But you still feel good. Like you don't have all the side effects of chemo, like any of them. So I'll wait five years if it means that that's how long it's going to take me to be cured and I still feel good for that entire time. Why not? May as well. I get to go to San Diego every six months for the next five years. So I'm hopeful. You know, the last CAT scan that I had showed that my tumor, my cancer has not spread beyond my liver, which I thought was wonderful. I did have an additional lesion on my liver. But you know, in the last few days, and like I said, this isn't anything to do with the tonic. They don't expect the tonic to work for at least a few months. But it could be because of the SEAC tea that I'm taking. I haven't really been feeling my tumors like I had been. And I think that's wonderful. Maybe they're shrinking. And maybe that CEA number is indicative of my tumor shrinking. So we shall see. <laughs> that is my Hoxi Clinic adventure. If you have any questions, additional questions, feel free to send, send a comment below. And I'll answer all your questions. I am very... I feel really good. My brother said, I almost feel left out that I don't have cancer because he really loved it there. He says, it's, I just want to go back there and just hang out. Maybe he should go to San Diego and be a driver. <laughs> but it's a, it was a really good experience. So much better than going to the doctor here where the doctors just don't really care about you. I mean, some of them do, but a whole heck of a lot of them don't. At least they don't act like they do. You could tell they cared there. They really cared. They were, it was a beautiful experience. So that's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, send them in the comments below. I'll be happy to answer them. And if you have something to share, if you've done a video on the Hoxie Clinic, then, you know, let me know. I would like to watch your video. and I'd like to hear your experience. And until next time, I hope you all are doing well and stay blessed. And God bless you all. Bye-bye.